Happy New Year. OK, this is a uh, uh, thing. Yeah, Year of Monkey. So it's time to, uh, to monkey around. Uh, OK, so uh, I think it's all uh, Jim's fault. Uh, because uh, last, last month he's talking about the ADAD. And he's uh, making it so uh, sound so simple that I thought, well, you know, we might be able to do it in FPGA. So uh, I spent a whole month try to uh, try to <coughs> to do something about it. Okay, so the summary: of Why we did that design an ADA, ADAD? Uh, because nobody designs a good CPU. Okay, so I talk a little bit about ADAD architecture. Just review. And then uh, I'll tell you a bit more about EP8080. That's my version of 8080. And uh, what I want to emphasize that this design is uh, extremely aggressive design. So I'm trying to uh, push uh, the envelope uh, to the best in point. OK, I thought uh, I'll <coughs> try to implement it on the FPGA kit, the Bravia 2, but so far I have not uh, uh, been able to move it onto, uh, into hardware. So everything is only in a simulator at uh, this moment. And I will show you uh, what, whatever I have accomplished uh, till last night. OK, well, that's a standing joke. Uh, fourth people always try to reinvent the wheel. Why? Because all the wheels invented so far are not round or not perfectly round. Okay, mostly square. So I think there's room to do a good design. Uh, nobody designed uh, a good CPU uh, because hardware people are worried too much about gates. And, uh, and they lose sight on the architecture or the importance of the uh, good architecture. And the software people worry too much about programming language because, you know, that's, that's what they use uh, computers for to run um, their favorite uh, languages, most likely C 
Uh, so I think the soft, uh, software people uh, try to build computers that will run C uh, language efficiently. But then they also lose sight of the of what the uh, a real good architecture must be. So the hardware people, uh, Intel, of course, uh, for uh, 40 years, they have pushed the hardware uh, limit in uh, uh, its x86 series to the point that it just override, uh, over, uh, uh, overrides everything, everybody else except ARM. Well, ARM start out to be a risk uh, architecture, but I think they, they saw the success of Intel and demise of all the other risk companies. So they are wise enough to also abandon the risk architecture and move on to the six, uh, which is the thumb two. So that's the, the general trend. And in, on the software side, Motorola, uh, of course, stole the uh, PDP-11 architecture. Uh, I always wonder why digital uh, didn't sue Motorola for the 60,000 uh, series. But uh, it's a fairly good architecture, uh, but uh, Motorola couldn't push the uh, hardware speed. And finally, it falls on the wayside. Couldn't compete uh, against Intel. And the Spark from Sun, the MIPS, and the Power PC have all faded into the background. So I think right now, what we are left is the Intel architecture and the uh, Thumb, Thumb 2, uh, left in the uh, field still hardly selling. Uh, did I? Software design. Okay, let's uh, uh, talk a little bit about the review the 8080 architecture. Uh, architecture. It's the third microprocessor uh, designed by Intel uh, after 4004 and 8008 in 1974. And of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, it was uh, the most successful micro. Uh, processor at the time. And it is an uh, accumulator based uh, design. One accumulator, six uh, register around the accumulator. Uh, these six register can be reconfigured as three 16 bit registers. And so, you know, it, it's a uh, almost a 16 bit design if they, they actually recognize the importance of it. but at the time I think they are kind of focused on 8-bit design and then uh, uh, then only uh, put this 16-bit uh, uh, registers or extended registers for address uh, computation and uh, if you look at, uh, into the uh, manual or the spec sheet uh, these, uh, the simplest instruction uh, needs 12 cycles. And, uh, well, <clears throat> uh, if you look inside more carefully, you can see actually two ALUs uh, in the design. In the uh, one 8 bit ALU, which can do all the arithmetic and uh, logic operations and a 16-bit ALU, uh, which is used mostly uh, only for address computation. So this is basically uh, what uh, you have, what they, uh, they have in the AD, uh, 8080. So in a schematic view, uh, you have the accumulator over there, uh, and then the ALU there, and then the registers uh, 
six eight-bit registers, and the two more are uh, hidden ones, W and Z. These two are used internally, and you cannot access uh, from the uh, software. Uh, and then you have a, a very nice, they put a stack pointer there, and program counter. So these are the uh, register uh, group. And they can kind of uh, do all the operations uh, once you uh, from the data uh, your instruction get decoded and it, it generate all the control signals and sequences uh, to execute uh, uh, the instructions and and here uh, these 16 bit uh, uh, registers are used mostly uh, to uh, to put data into the address buffer the address buffer goes into the mem uh, go to the memory and re release the data onto the data bus. So this is uh, basically what uh, what the what we call the architecture. So it uh, it uh, uh, the instruction set pretty much fill uh, the a bit uh, uh, space. Uh, it used, I think, more than 200 uh, valid uh, code. And uh, you can see uh, in, in the second uh, block, these are all the move uh, uh, instructions. So you move from eight uh, registers from another eight registers or memory. And this block is the uh, ALU block. It does and uh, add, subtract, and uh, all exclusive all and and all these uh, things. Okay, and then on the top block, uh, on the uh, in the box, bottom block, it's mostly the jump instruction, jump call return, and with some other things uh, uh, which are related to the uh, call. Uh, so you have to push and pop, push and pop, uh, separated out as individual instructions. Uh, but these are mostly, uh, you know, <laughs> required uh, for subroutine threading. So they have uh, uh, this block uh, implementing these uh, uh, related instructions. And uh, in the top block, it's the miscellaneous uh, thing that uh, you have to do uh, in addition to the other things. So uh, basically, it's uh, uh, pretty filled up. OK, so uh, looking at this, uh, I look in the open core uh, website. There are two uh, ADAD implementations. One in Verilog and the other in VHDL. And uh, I tried, I downloaded them both, tried to look at them, couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't uh, uh, understand them at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do understand the instruction set. So uh, what I thought was, well, you know, if I haven't done it once, I would not be able to understand their code. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. What you're saying is the uh, VGL that you got for the 8080 yes. executes most of the instructions in one clock cycle. No, no. The, uh, that's uh, current Im implementation. No. Okay. Because when I was exposed to the 8080, mm -hmm. the professor actually showed us the clock on an oscilloscope, mm -hmm. and it had four clocks. Yeah. Yes. This, that when they, the clock was one. Yeah, yeah. But, the, uh, but it's, you... Uh, it's important to remember that the 8080 had two phases. Yes. So if you're really counting clocks, you've got to count edges. Yes. <laughs> and I think they actually use both edges of each clock. I was, yeah, I so. looked at that and I went, wow. <laughs> <laughs> 200, no, actually, the thing, I, I remember yeah. showing that. Yeah. 
I'm going, wow. Yeah. 250,000 instructions per second? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Mind you. Actually, uh, your, your end was, uh, was true, not, not true for the ED80. It's a true for all the, uh, all the okay. and it's classic design. Uh, to execute one instruction, you need four cycles. Right. First cycle, fetch the instruction. Yeah. Second cycle, decode the sources. And third cycle, execute it. And fourth cycle, store back. Exactly. That's so exactly that's the classic. Yeah. That's the classic uh, uh, clocking scheme. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Intel, I think, uh, uh, 88 is way before this kind of uh, uh, architectural uh, uh, solidified. Okay, so they these these are hardware people. Remember, these are hardware people. They try to design calculators. Okay, and uh, this is basically the calculator design. Okay, and uh, carry out uh, carry on into a uh, microprocessor. So what? My design, EP8080, what I want to do, what I think I can do, is that uh, I can execute uh, one byte instruction in a single clock cycle. And uh, in 8080, there are three different uh, kind of instruction. One byte instruction, two byte instruction, and three byte instructions. And so to execute multiple byte instructions, uh, you need one cycle per byte. That's a, at least you need one cycle per byte. Sometimes, uh, sometimes more, uh, if the instruction is more complicated. But uh, you know, if there are three bytes instruction, you have to fetch these three bytes individually. You can only fetch one byte in one cycle. So that's uh, that's what uh, you have to do. But for most uh, one byte instruction. I should be able to execute in a single cycle. Okay, that that means I'm going to collapse these four classical cycles: fetch, uh, decode the source, execute, and store the result. I want I can compress all these four phases, four clocks, into a single clock. Okay, so that's what I call the extremely aggressive design. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Chang Rival uh, is not here. So this, this is the, uh, the CPU architecture that Chang and I, I forgot whether I invented or Chang invented, but we finally both use it. So to view a, a, a processor, uh, this is the best view, okay. So we have a, a set of registers. Uh, if you uh, fetch one instruction from the memory into the instruction decoder, instruction latch, then it drives the uh, decoder, generate all the control signals, and produce some, re uh, some results. And these results are routed uh, through the multiplexers into the register. And then each register will have an individual latch signal, which, is, uh, which are also generated by the uh, decoding logic. So these, uh, if you want to store anything in any of the registers, you have to enable uh, these uh, what I call the load signal or latch signal. And on the rising edge of the clock, data gets uh, latched into the, uh, into the register. Okay? And then the cycle repeats. You, now you have new data in the registers, and you fetch the next instruction, and it repeats. So this is a very nice view of the of the processor or a very uh, processor designed right okay so you 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 have a set of registers which holds some um, uh, some data and when I when I instruction came in 
it's get decoded, produce all the uh, routing logic ALU results, including all the latch uh, signals, and also the control signals uh, for the multiplexers. So when all these signals are produced and distributed over the entire chip, specifically uh, in front of the registers. And then the next rising edge of the clock hit, data gets latched into the registers, one or all. You can latch data into all of them at the same time if you, uh, if you so desire. And this is the uh, this is the design, okay? So everything can be executed in a single cycle if you designed it right. Okay, so this is what I call extremely aggressive design. The decoder starts decoding even before. Uh, the instruction is latched into the uh, into the instruction uh, latch, okay? Because when you give out an address to the memory, the memory produces the next instruction, and there you can use that information already, okay? You don't have to latch the information into the instruction uh, latch, and then in the next cycle try to decode it, okay? So this, this, this is uh, uh, very important because it, the information is already available. The instructions are already there. It's on the data bus. But if you can grab it, send it to the decoder, and uh, you know, you can work, uh, you can start working right there. Uh, you don't have to wait uh, till the instruction uh, uh, to be latched into the instruction latch. But the inst instruction latch is important here in this design because when you have multiple uh, multiple byte instruction, you have to remember the instruction, uh, and then you can fetch the new instructions, uh, new data. On the data bus, so the uh, the instruction is gone if you don't latch it. So in multiple uh, byte instructions, you latch the first byte into the instruction decoder, and then you fetch the data one or two bytes. But now the instruction is in the instruction latch, and there you use that information into the decoder, de decoding logic, and produce all the uh, right uh, results, and then latch it in the uh, uh, registers uh, that needs you new information. So here, decoder starts decoding even before uh, la uh, instruction latch. The ALU start executing while source registers are select still being selected. Okay, so when you have the instruction available, whether it is from the data bus or from the instruction latch, you have the information there, and this information allows you to set up, uh, configure all the uh, logic uh, in the ALU and in the routing uh, logic, and including all the multiplexers uh, in front of the registers. So all these actions can go on at the same time. Maybe the, uh, the you know, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the source register has not selected the proper source. How can you do the computation? But no matter, because when the uh, source is selected and the correct information is there, then the data will fall, the correct data will fall through, okay? You just wait, give it enough time for the ripple to settle. And hopefully, 
And I think most likely that all the logic will stabilize before the next rising edge of the clock. So all computations are performed in parallel. Okay. So I'm doing when you uh, <coughs> when you are not doing uh, uh, arithmetics or logic, the arithmetic all the arithmetic all the add subtract and all executable are done. I do uh, are being done at the same time. Okay, whether you want it or not, you only select the result that you want and latch them into the uh, the register that needs this new information on the next rising clock edge. <laughs> okay. Any comments? So you are using external memory here. Uh, right now, the design is uh, uh, using the uh, memory inside the FPGA. Okay. But uh, it uh, does uh, uh, no problem with external memory. And actually, the external memory is preferred than the memory in, inside FPGA. Because FPGA, the memory inside FPGA, it has lots of way, uh, you have lots of different ways of configuring them, but they're all wrong. Okay. There's no, uh, they didn't do the uh, memory design correctly. The, yes. The results are latched on the rising edge. Yes. The results from the memory are they latched on the falling edge? So uh, yes, I will talk about it later. The, yes, the the memory uh, to clues uh, around the deficiency in the memory design. I have to latch the address on the falling edge of the clock, so that uh, the data is available in the next half clock. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, if they, uh, they I, I prefer the de design of RAM memory as asynchronous, uh, asynchronous uh, memory that you can put uh, address anytime onto the address bus and then the, da the data will f uh, flow out of the data port. Okay, and the, uh, it's just that uh, uh, on the clock edge, you latch the data uh, that you want. Uh, but um, uh, the design, these uh, uh, in the, I think most most of the design, Xilinx uh, and uh, all the, uh, they all prefer to have an edge to latch the address first. And once the address is latched, then the data will be available. So this, this is the, the syn uh, uh, synchronous uh, design, uh, which uh, is not, I don't think it's the correct way to do a good design. I think asynchronous uh, memory design is much, much preferred. Okay, here is the, here is the memory latches address on the falling edge of the clock. So it is a half clock ahead of the rising edge. So I would uh, have to assume that memory data is available immediately for at least half of the half the cycle. And all routing and computation must complete before the rising edge of the next clock. So that means uh, if you are reading memory, you only have half a clock uh, to work, okay? So I think this uh, impact the overall speed of the design, but that's the uh, deficiency in memory design. If you design the memory correctly, I don't have to wait, okay? I don't have to latch the uh, uh, address. Just give me the right address, and uh, then the memory provide the data so I can latch it uh, on the clock edge. Okay, so in the 8080, uh, uh, it actually has two ALU structures. An 8-bit ALU handle all the math and logic operation among the 8-bit registers and memory. And 16-bit uh, ALU handles operation on the combined 16-bit register, mo mostly address, com uh, address computations. So, you know, 
it, it's a it's a very very simple thing that uh, just get rid of the 8-bit ALU and put all the functions uh, in the 16-bit ALU and uh, <coughs> this becomes a, a good 16-bit uh, microprocessor uh, but they are just uh, short of that but uh, th this design indicates that they are aware of the uh, even an 8-bit microprocessor address has to be 16-bit or, uh, or longer. Otherwise, the uh, the the uh, the the CPU uh, will not be able to function optimally. But uh, you know, just a little step ahead, you got a 16-bit uh, uh, microprocessor. Okay, this is the most complicated uh, operation uh, in in the in the system. This is the uh, 8 bit ALU. Okay. So you can see uh, in front of the, uh, uh, this uh, source select, you have all the registers, uh, not all the uh, register, only eight of them A, B, C, D, E, H, L, and the memory, uh, memory bus. So you can select the source, one of them, and uh, feed it into the ALU. And another input is from the E register. So this uh, ALU uh, would generate, would uh, do all these math operations in parallel. And, uh, and then this ALU select would select one of them and put it on the ALU out uh, bus. And this ALU out bus, together with many other uh, possible input, and one of them will be selected by the uh, multiplexer select uh, for the particular register. And then this, uh, this uh, every register have its own latch signal. And this latch signal, if it is set to one on the next rising edge of the clock, it will get latched into the register. Okay. So I think this is the most complicated and probably the longest delay uh, in between uh, input and output. And if, uh, if this, uh, this uh, structure uh, can do things correctly, the, the whole CPU will be able to function. OK, uh, this uh, uh, is the. Uh, extended ALU, the 16-bit ALU. The 16-bit ALU, it, it has a uh, source on the BC, two registers combined as a 16-bit register, BC, DE, HL, and WZ, these are the internal register. And the WZ are mainly used, uh, I didn't read the, uh, main, uh, the uh, the data sheet carefully enough. But uh, my suspicion is W and Z are used to store the next two bytes uh, if, there, if there are uh, data after the... You're probably right on that. Hmm? You're probably right on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Values and HL basically just like a point. Right, right. And the moment, where's this WZ? Yeah. Well, that was internal. Yes, yes. And I think it, uh, at least I use it to store when you have a three byte uh, instruction. The first byte get latched into the I register, the second byte uh, is uh, uh, latched into the Z, and the third byte, if there is uh, one, will be latched into W. And so these uh, will be used uh, to, to do things. And it can also uh, take data from the um, stack pointer and from the P. Uh, in the design, SP and the uh, stack pointer and the program counter has their own incrementing logic. Uh, but I think this design uh, would uh, take care of the incrementing SPNP through this logic if you uh, so desire. 
and that will save a lot of gates. Okay. But I, uh, I was uh, using the EP16 design uh, as my basis, and so I modified it uh, uh, gradually and tried to turn it into 8080. Uh, so lots of features in the EP16 uh, carried uh, over. Uh, but I think in a, uh, in a better design or most, more efficient design, this, thing can be, this logic can be uh, eliminated. But I was uh, you know, so focused on just getting something done, something done before the meeting. <laughs> okay, if it is working, uh, don't mess, uh, mess it. Uh, but there are, uh, there are uh, logic already lay, uh, lay in the design. So later on, I can uh, optimize it further. So this one, the other input is uh, HL. This basically uh, implemented called a DAD, uh, the extended uh, adding, which add BC or DE uh, or HL onto HL uh, register. So it has four implement, four, uh, uh, or uh, <coughs> functions. So incrementing, decrementing, add the HL, and I uh, put in another selection X in. Uh, you can feed the data without modification. This is a, a very important. I didn't do it uh, efficiently for the uh, the the uh, regular ALU, uh, which I will uh, I will try late, uh, later. But this way. You see, you already have a selector there. And if you just want to move data around, you can move it through this, uh, this uh, structure. It, it has, uh, you create more delays. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, we assume that the delay, uh, the delay in the arithmetic and logic line uh, is much longer than just past the data around. Uh, so there should it shouldn't be any uh, any problem, uh, and it will save lots of uh, logic uh, and reduce the size of the implementation. Yes. What is the third box selecting? Uh, this oh uh, I didn't uh, didn't uh, 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 put down the other input. Uh, so each log uh, each. Uh, register can accept uh, data from the X out or from many other uh, sources. From okay. The uh, yes. For, uh, for, uh, for yes, yes. So it, it, it can have uh, data from many other uh, other sources. So this is a very general design. Each register has a multiplexer in front of it. And uh, the, the, this multiplexer will select all the different uh, uh, sources of information that uh, this uh, register needs. Okay, each different A, B, C, D, and H, L. Each kind of uh, uh, uses uh, input uh, uh, of its own. Okay, so each uh, register has a uh, uh, has to select data from a uh, different set of inputs. So this uh, uh, is a very general design uh, that you can uh, you can accommodate all these various instructions. Yes. No. Okay. So these are the mo uh, two most complicated uh, structures that the, the data has to ripple through. Okay. If, if they uh, can ripple through uh, within one or a half clock cycle, you know, this design uh, will work, okay? So another, uh, another aggressiveness uh, uh, is in the stack, okay? I look at the stack and uh, feel really awkward. Uh, in putting the stack in the memory, okay? Because the memory bus is only 16-bit, uh, uh, memory bus, 
data burst is only eight bits. So if we are push and pop data, uh, they are all 16 bit data. So you have to uh, do, do it twice. And it is, uh, uh, I really c cannot bring myself down to that level because I have already a very good stack uh, in my, actually I have two stacks in the EP16. Uh, so I just use, uh, you know, just coming out the other uh, stack and uh, retain only the return stack. And uh, this uh, stack can be uh, used very efficiently because uh, the stack can be pushed and popped in a single cycle. Okay. And the problem with stack is the pre-incrementing and post-decrementing. If you are pushing into the stack, you need the pre-incrementing. Uh, you want to push uh, the data on top of the stack. So you have to increment the stack pointer and then push things. But if you try to do it uh, that way, you need another cycle, okay? Increment the stack pointer and then uh, and point to the uh, new place that you want to store the data. So. Uh, my uh, EP, uh, EP series design, uh, the stack pointer I, I actually has two stack pointer, SP and SP plus one. These two are always available. So if you are do, doing uh, uh, pushing, you use SP plus one. And you can store data directly in, uh, into the, uh, onto, push it onto the, on the top. And in the same cycle, you increment SP. So everything can be accomplished in one cycle. If you are doing pop, well, you just decrement the uh, you just decrement the DSP because you, uh, you don't uh, need to do anything else. Uh, but anytime you need uh, to read uh, the data from the stack, SP is always pointing to the current top, so you can just fetch the data right there. So uh, you know. Using these two uh, two pointers, uh, you can do a very efficient uh, stack and implement the pre-incrementing instructions, post-decrementing instructions uh, with all the data movement in a single point cycle. And uh, all conditional and unconditional jump and call needs three cycles, not because I really need the three cycles accomplished the push, pop, and jump. It's because uh, jump and call instructions has the address following. So they are uh, two more bytes. And you have to read these two bytes before you know where to jump or where to call. So jump and call needs three cycles. Not because they need three cycles, it's because they need to read. Uh, the target address uh, for uh, in the two more cycles, and return. It doesn't. It, it's a one byte instruction. It doesn't need anything else, and need can be done in a single cycle. So this this is the uh, most uh, most efficient design for uh, to operate a return stack. And uh, yes. So it has no multi-byte opcodes except when you need immediate data to. Yes, follow. yes, yes. The, 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 the immediate data, you load immediate, uh, call, and jump, they all need two more bytes of 16 bit data. And you, you have to spend clock cycles to read them. And some of the, uh, if they are 8 bit data, so they are. Uh, these are two byte instructions. So you need one more cycle to read the, uh, the data of the bus. Okay, now, well, the Bravia, that's, that's my target, FPGA, Bra uh, Bravia board. And I think uh, synthesizing uh, the 8080, it took about 40, uh, 44% of the logic space here. I think the uh, EP16 took about a third of the logic. 
So the, uh, the 8080 is a much more complicated machine uh, than a 16-bit uh, uh, CPU. So this XP, uh, XP2 Bravi kit, uh, it's a complete uh, FPGA development system for $49. Uh, that I can afford. And uh, the ch FPGA chip uh, is very capable. And I've uh, done EP16 and uh, EP32 uh, all on it. And I took the EP16 code, converted to EP8080. You know, when doing this, just before I, before I, uh, I did it, I was looking for my EP8. And I remember definitely, I did EP8, okay? That's an 8-bit bus. So if I have EP8, you know, it's uh, going to be uh, very easy to convert to the uh, EP88 because it handles the 8-bit bus uh, quite naturally. I was looking through my computer and couldn't find it. <laughs> it's lost. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, I, I, I found one paper uh, called uh, P8. And it uh, has some, uh, something talking about the P8. And somewhere it mentioned that the, in the, on the previous uh, more on uh, more on fourth engines. I have uh, you know, a paper uh, on the design, and then it mentioned that uh, P8 design was not done in VHDL. It was done in schematics. <laughs> so this morning I came uh, into. Dave's office and says, where, where is that collection of more on fourth engines? So I looked through it and yeah, I found the, uh, uh, the, the paper on EP8 and it was in schematic design. So it's- Is that the one you did for the JPL guy? No, no. So like, uh, you, you wanted schematics as well as I recall. Uh, no, he's happy with uh, VHDL. Uh, so, the, you know, because I, I have this board to prove it. You know, this was the Xilinx XC4005. And it's one of the very early Xilinx FPGA. It has 5,000 gates. And this board uh, is called the Axis, X-E-S-S -S board. And this board, uh, it's very interesting that uh, this board put the F FPGA there uh, in between the memory and uh, AD51 chip. And so th this, this board, the purpose of this board is to uh, tell the people, see how easy, if you use FPGA, how easy it is to interface a memory chip to the AD51. Okay, so that was the whole purpose of this chip. And then I said, well, uh, with 5,000 gates, I probably can put the MUP21 in, the, in this chip. And then I can remove the AD51 and then uh, talk directly to the, uh, to the, to the uh, RAM memory. But then I said, where is the code? Why is it wrong? <laughs> this chip at the time was not big enough to hold to hold that much data in in ROM. Okay, so I was uh, uh, looking through the uh, Dave's pile of more uh, NC4000 and found that yeah, it, this board the access has the tools uh, to talk to uh, from the computer uh, from the PC. You can actually download the code directly to this RAM. Okay, then uh, when you reset, turn turn on this uh, this chip, it can read the data directly. I think that's what uh, uh, what uh, uh, what happened then. But uh, 
So that this this was a very nice, uh, very nice uh, uh, system that uh, <laughs> first uh, uh, first experimenting with the FPGA. Okay, so we have th this guy, and this is a uh, uh, much better, uh, much uh, much more powerful. FPGA system, so you have the, all the uh, all the nice uh, peripherals around it, and then the board has the uh, XP2 uh, FPGA on it. Uh, the board has a, a extra uh, two megabits of SPI flash memory, uh, 128K uh, SRAM. Switches, LEDs, and U USB uh, cable to uh, do the downloading and the configuration. So it's uh, very nice. But uh, it's nice to have these things. But the chip itself has enough memory, so I really don't need uh, flash or the SRAM. Okay. And I couldn't use the 8-bit SRAM in the uh, EP16 and EP32 designs because then uh, this design requires 16-bit or 32-bit memory. Uh, but the 8-bit thing, it's, it's nice to have it there. Uh, but I'm not using it. OK, this FPGA has uh, 5K LUT4 logic cells. So each, each of these logic cells, I think, is equivalent, equivalent to 16 uh, gates. And it has embedded block memory. That's where I can put uh, uh, the code in. And this uh, embedded memory can be initialized by internal RAM, no, internal ROM. Uh, uh, so 10k bits of distributed memory uh, that you can implement the stacks, five volts, and all these things internally. DSP block, I have no need of it. Multiplier, I don't need them. Uh, 144 pin uh, a package is too big. Uh, I only need 16 uh, pins, but uh, no, 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 I need 20 pins, uh, more than 20 pins. 16 bit data and uh, eight, uh, eight bit data and the 16 bit of the address. So in this was a written in uh, 2009. At the time, I have already used the Zydinx, Atira, Lattice, and Intel. And these companies, I think they are getting much bigger now. Uh, but among all these, uh, I think Lattice has the most satisfying FPGA. It's a single chip SOC solution. So it has the wrong RAM already uh, in, uh, inside the chip. Uh, all the other designs, uh, they need uh, external memory. Uh, it has the cheapest uh, development board. It has free development software. So when I uh, try to do it, I, my old computer has already retired, disappeared into the junkyard. And uh, so I have to uh, download the newer version of the tool, development software. Uh, I think when I was using Lattice Diamond 1.0, uh, before for all the EP16 and EP32 designs. And now the diamond is 3.6. But fortunately, everything compiles correctly. Yeah, I was, uh, I was happy that it, the first thing I did was to check if my EP16 is still saying OK. And it did. OK, so I was very happy. <laughs> And once I'm sure that the EP16 is working, then I can proceed uh, and check the EP16 code uh, to uh, implement the ADAD instruction set. So at the, uh, the design implementation has uh, five modules, five VHD, uh, VHDL files. So the top level EPAD chip, so it specifies the 
the overall architecture of the chip, and which has the uh, CPU in EPAD, and has the RAM uh, in RAM memory, and it has the UART and GPIO. So all, all, all this code need, need to be modified to uh, the data bus have to trim from 16-bit to 8-bit, but that's not a uh, uh, terribly uh, difficult job. But then uh, the instruction set, uh, the instruction 8080 instruction set is much bigger, 200 some instructions. Uh, so the decoder logic is much bigger, and in the EP16. I think I only got 25 instructions. So that was a very, very clean, very easy implementation. But here I have to uh, decode 200, uh, 256 instructions. So the CPU design EPAD, uh, VHD, basically contains three sections. First section is all the multiplexers. So the multiplexers, these are the static, uh, static, uh, logic, okay, and if you implement them, uh, they are there and uh, 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 they do not change. And then the instruction decoder, you have to decode 256 instructions, and you have uh, based on each instruction, uh, each instruction will require you set up the uh, multiplexers uh, in its uh, own way, uh, setting up the latch signals in its own way. And depending upon how many clock cycles it needs, uh, you have to uh, using phases, uh, what, what are called phases. You know, in uh, to instruction, uh, one instruction, you need one to five uh, clocks, okay? And I call them phases, phase zero, one, two, three, four. So uh, each instruction will call out uh, each instruction, if, has, if it has m multiple phases, uh, each phase will call out uh, what's the next phase it has to execute, okay? And of course, the, uh, the last, uh, f in the last phase, you just reset phase to zero, and it will start uh, to, uh, the fetching cycle again. So uh, most, of, uh, most instructions were verified. I, I, and I try to uh, look at the instruction sheet and select uh, one among the, uh, each one uh, instruction in a, in, a, in a class, in a group, and uh, make sure that that particular instruction uh, produces uh, the correct results. So most instructions were verified uh, that way. And this, this is actually when I was doing the uh, EP, EP8 implementation. I made up two, uh, two versions of the code. One version uses a clock, and another version uh, routes the clock to a switch <laughs> on a board. So if I push the switch, I can simulate a clock. And then, since everything, all the CMOS logic are static, if there's no clock, there's no change, okay? So I can push one, uh, one clock and watch the data bus and the, uh, the instruction bus to make sure that uh, uh, the, 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 it's executing the uh, right instruction in the next cycle. And so the, uh, in this simulator, I, I was doing the same thing uh, because it was uh, very difficult to write a test bed. And the, exercise the CPU. So I just move the CPU to the top level design. And then the, uh, this requires the clock, the reset, and uh, uh, it would output the data, uh, output address, address bus is an out, out, uh, uh, output signal. And you have uh, input data and output data. So I just impose a static signal on the in, uh, data input bus, and the, the, the chip would take this uh, signal as an instru instruction. So it will execute that instruction. And if it will, it will need uh, two more instructions, 
it will read the same byte as the two uh, data instructions. So for example, jump uh, is a C3. C3 is the jump instruction. So jump to where? It actually read the C3 three times. So it will jump to C3, C3. Okay, if, it, if that happened, jump is correct, okay? So all the other instructions are uh, similarly this way. If there are only a single instruction, you can uh, just watch the internal register to verify that uh, the register uh, got the changed correctly. If there are two bytes, then the next byte will be read. The instruction will be interpreted as data, but you take that data and uh, uh, so. So this this is a very uh, very good uh, a good method to debug the uh, the CPU uh, with uh, the smallest amount of time, which I don't have. You know, <laughs> I think the the whole thing worked only last week, and uh, everything compiles correctly, and uh, uh, then the uh, then the synthesizer. Uh, throw me off, uh, you know, all different uh, error messages. Uh, yeah, you have to correct. <laughs> so, and last night, only la last night, the, uh, when I check out the most of the instruction in the CPU, and I, uh, you know, then I move the uh, move the uh, EPAD uh, underscore chip to my top level, and that include the CPU and the memory. I uh, still didn't, uh, uh, didn't compile the I.O. Uh, modules, just uh, CPU and memory module. So, and I was so happy uh, last night, uh, I think oh, five o'clock, it actually executed the first jump instruction and then it follows, uh, uh, follows uh, uh, and here uh, it jumps to the code. So you know, it, it, the, in all the initial uh, initialized code, I don't know uh, whether they execute correctly or not, but it did execute all these instruction to the point that it jumps to code. Okay, so that's a, that's a, I, I I got that. Uh, uh, that that stream of the uh, uh, address, I was so happy. I went out and go grab the some uh, uh, sashimi <laughs> to celebrate. It. What did you have? Hmm? What did you have? Uh, the sashimi. Uh, well, you know, um, yeah. uh, I got the tuna and the other one. I didn't. I didn't uh, uh, do the tuna. I thought I'll do it tonight. And the other one was uh, chopped up. <laughs> you know, uh, George know that uh, there's a Japanese supermarket in San Mateo, and at six o'clock, they allow you that uh, they will mark down the uh, yeah. all the sushi price half price. Yeah. Yeah. And six o'clock. Yeah, and and I got there. I think of fifteen minutes to six, and there was always a line, already a line there, and I was the fourth. <laughs> but at six o'clock, the guy said, "Don't push, don't shop. <laughs> Just go pick up what you want. <laughs> go grab it." So I put, uh, grabbed four boxes. Very nice, I think. Uh, 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 the half price is uh, always worth it, no matter what you got. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Okay. So uh, let me show you uh, the implementation of the multiplexers. Okay. So this is the source uh, to select the uh, source register from A, B. C, D, E, and H, L, and memory, okay? So this way, uh, this way you uh, do the source select, and then you, uh, when, the, uh, when you so select when B underscore A is a one, you select B, C underscore A is a one, you select C, and these get into the first multiplexers, produce the, uh, you select the source that you want uh, into the ALU. 
Okay, this is the uh, most complicated uh, uh, multiplexer, and which implements the ALU. So on the ALU, you can do A plus source A. Uh, you see the uh, the uh, this is the adder. The other source is uh, A register, and the one source is on the source uh, source multiplexer. So you can add, subtract, add with carry, subtract with carry. And or exclusive or, and th this one compare, I I still have to work on it. It's uh, it's uh, it's much more complicated uh, because you do the uh, arithmetic, but you don't don't store it. Okay, and you generate the logic, uh, produce the flags, but not uh, actually uh, store the result. And then you have the uh, carry uh, uh, that you have the shift. Shift right, shift left, rotate right, lo rotate uh, left, complement the carry, uh, and things. Okay. And so all these things uh, uh, can be selected, all the, all the function can be selected uh, from this uh, multiplexer. And now this is the decoder. The decoder is uh, a different logic, use the case, use a big case statement. Basically, you have a case, then you have 256 cases. Okay. But uh, uh, you know, the design was, as uh, Jim uh, showed la uh, last month, you know, the selection of the source and destination, the three bit for source, three bit for destination, then you can cover uh, eight, eight cases. Uh, and eight by eight, you know, you can uh, have 64 cases. So the move instruction can be done basically as one case. Okay. Uh, and then this, uh, so the no op, uh, no op is not uh, doing nothing, okay? You still have to do uh, something. Uh, what you do is increment uh, the P register, okay? And then this, uh, this uh, setup T, uh, setup C, so you uh, you have the uh, P P S uh, uh, the uh, uh, the flag register needs to be loaded into uh, and zero one select I think uh, the correct uh, set uh, set the T to one okay and you still have to increment the P so this is uh, uh, two of the simplest uh, uh, instructions. And all uh, these instructions are single cycle instructions. Uh, so there's a phase set to zero, uh, phase it, next phase will be zero, so that it will fetch the next instruction. And this one uh, is O1, and it's okay. How it is buried in the movie instruction. So the, basically, the, what the instruction decoder should uh, interpret as move from memory to memory and that of course is not is nonsense and they use this one to do the halt and to the halt is very simple uh you still increment the p but don't load it okay so the this uh, p doesn't move data doesn't move and the and the cpu basically stuck there Okay, and this is what how uh, meant to be. I don't know where, where there is. <laughs> uh, that, there's more more things to to the heart because then you, uh, you know the index back. Uh, once you get the um, CPU is hot, how do you revive it? You need interrupts, and the interrupt logic I have not done. And then this move register to memory. Uh, so it's code type, it's a two cycle. Uh, so the code type is a one, and then it has phase one and phase, uh, uh, phase zero and phase one. So in phase one, uh, I'll go get the uh, uh, loading instruction, okay? And the, uh, the address select is HL. So I'm actually change the, uh, change the address bus in the ne next cycle to HL, so I can fetch the data uh, correctly. 
So the next phase, phase one, uh, the next phase is set to zero. So that th this completes this instruction, uh, ready to, uh, to do the next one. And then select the source, and then select the data, and then set the right one so that data can be latched to the memory. Yes? Just give one. Why is this the address and the right stroke happened on the same cycle? Uh, it is because uh, it has to be two cycles because we are uh, move registered memory. So the next cycle, the, the address bus has to be changed. Okay, so you need another cycle because if you stay uh, with one cycle, the address bus is always uh, putting the P, the program counter onto the address. Oh, okay, so phase zero, the address bus is not yet set up. Uh, not, not yet, okay. So there, uh, address select. You select, select HL adder. Uh, so then in the next cycle, the HL will be sent out to the address bus. And that's what we want because we have the address bus there and then if we have the right data on the data bus, and then we can latch it into the memory. We can write into the memory, okay? So you, uh, you have to set the right one to uh, uh, move the data out, data select, uh, yes, source data, okay? Okay, so that's the, these are some uh, examples of the, uh, of the decoder. And then the third section is finite state machine, which control the, uh, the, uh, the instruction execution sequence. So here uh, it's called a process. So it takes a clock and a clear. So when the uh, clear is at one, it's a reset state. Uh, you set P equals zero, and a lot of other things if you want to initialize them on the reset. And then, uh, the, there's a clock tick event and clock equal one that specifies on the rising edge. And uh, what you do on the rising edge, you latch phase, uh, uh, you latch next phase into the phase. So this is you you set up this uh, this uh, what's the next phase? Uh, have to do. If next phase is a zero, you you go to the uh, there's a new instruction. Uh, if a phase is not zero, then you can uh, go to phase one, two, three, uh, so so forth. Interrupt. I have have not done anything, but if I load is equal to one, then the data bus is latching to the uh, I register. So all the uh, this uh, finite state machine, there's a whole bunch of if else uh, statement, and Looking at the, this is a latch signal. If a particular latch signal is set to one, then data is latched from the multiplexer, output of the multiplexer uh, into the particular register. Okay, so that uh, kind of take care of this uh, multi-phased uh, instruction execution sequences. Okay, so this is another review of the AD, AD instruction zero to three uh, three F. That's a basically register operation. Forty to seventy five seven F. That's a move instruction. Eighty to B F. That's A L U operations. And uh, C zero to F F. The transfer and some miscellaneous operations. So you have to decode. So th this uh, uh, basically uh, divide the instruction set into four regions based on the, uh, the top two bits uh, in, the, uh, in the instruction, bit six and bit seven. So zero, zero, that's the first region, and uh, zero, one, that's the move instruction, uh, one, zero, that's LLU, one, one, that transfer and uh, operations. So move and ALU, uh, these are the uh, the the most uh, easily decoded uh, instructions, but uh, on the other uh, instruction, many of you have to decode them individually. 
So make make it make this uh, uh, this uh, case statement a gigantic uh, structure. Okay, one of the uh, one of the uh, things that uh, for test bedding, how do you test this this whole thing? And uh, I thought that yeah, we uh, I wanted uh, the eighty eighty fourth implementation, and I look uh, look through. Uh, couldn't find the uh, object code for the uh, AD, AD fifth, uh, fourth. I was first looking there. And yeah, there's uh, lots of implementations, but uh, you know, there are source code available, but there's no object, uh, no uh, binary object. And uh, at last, I went to the, uh, the Z80 fourth, which was uh, Input by my friend Ken Chen in Taiwan. When, when we first released the EP, uh, uh, E4th model, and he took the model and implemented Z80. And uh, it's it interesting that uh, at the time, uh, there was no good uh, uh, Z80 assembler, uh, public domain Z80 assembler. So one of the uh, <coughs> When we designed the E fourth model and release it, I told people that uh, you only have to worry about thirty two primitives, and these primitives, you, if you can write them in assembly, that's fine. If you find a good assembler, but if you don't have an assembler, use the uh, Microsoft uh, MASM and just code in the data. As data uh, code in the instructions, a data statement. Okay, so can just just that he <laughs> just just db da 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 db da 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 db for for each uh, each of the uh, primitives, and then all the other uh, all the high level things are just basic addresses. So the Mason handle that uh, really beautifully. And I, I look at his code. I was worried that the, if he used any of the Z80 code, then uh, I would not be able to handle it. But I look at least uh, uh, the amount of code that uh, scanned, all the code seemed to be 8080 instructions. So he didn't use any of the uh, Z80 specific, like the, you know, the bank uh, register bank switch or something like that. So I just copied the ROM image and placed them into the VHD. Uh, uh, actually, uh, the uh, memory synthesizer. Uh, you configure the memory with the memory synthesizer, and you can uh, you can tell the memory synthesizer where uh, the ROM data data is. Then it would uh, compile all the uh, data from that, uh, from from there. Uh, so that was uh, uh, pretty nice. Uh, <coughs> But uh, the the memory synthesizer. One uh, many other. Uh, I tried to use the memory, uh, but couldn't get anywhere. Uh, because the uh, when I synthesize the whole thing, and I try to execute, it's just zero. You know, address is always zero. And all the first instructions that jump to one hundred. Okay, uh, but it, it after synthesis, uh, after synthesis. All the memory is always zero. Uh, for, uh, I was puzzled over it uh, for a long time. And finally fi uh, found that uh, there is a box in the memory, uh, memory synthesizer. And it allows you to choose big ending, uh, little ending, small ending, and none. So try the uh, big ending, doesn't work. Try the small ending doesn't work, and try the uh, try the uh, the none. Uh, none <coughs> looks awful because uh, it just break down all the inv individual bits in the address lines. Uh, Sixteen address lines you have to specify each one, and eight data line you have to specify each one. So the the the, the VHDL code looks ugly, but. Uh, uh, <coughs> But that worked, <laughs> so I was very happy there. And uh, 
you know, to test it, uh, just use re specify RAM memory as the top uh, module and give it that address and see what's out. So none of the, uh, the other selections uh, work, but when you select none of the uh, byte order seem to work. And if everything works, it should say, okay, okay. I have to get UR to uh, incorporate UR code in there. And uh, uh, GPIO doesn't matter, but I need to get the UR to work. Uh, but that's the next, uh, uh, next step. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, quickly uh, show you the uh, the uh, okay. This this is the uh, the diamond. So what I have here is the uh, uh, EPAD module. So I just quickly scan through. So you have to define all the everything, you know, VHDL, everything you uh, you use, you have to declare them as the uh, logic or logic vectors. And now uh, they, here are all the, uh, the multiplexers, okay? And each, reg each register multiplexer in front of it select the proper uh, data that you want to latch into the, uh, that you, uh, you have to latch into the register on the rising clock, uh, on the rising edge of the clock. So here are all the uh, each register, one bit register array or anything, uh, need to have a specific uh, latch signal. And then the latch signal, and also the select, the multiplexer select, you have to give the uh, right selection. Uh, this way you can you know, get the uh, proper information. And here is the, uh, mm, the decoder logic. All these selection uh, signals uh, need to be initialized. So. Uh, when you design the multiplexer correctly or properly, the selection zero, you must uh, put the selection zero in the most often used selection. And this way, uh, when, the, the, uh, when the decoder is initialized, it's always uh, have that configuration. And you only have to change a few of the loading signals, selectors, multiplexers, and the so that they will do uh, the uh, specific things in that uh, particular instruction. So here is the big case statement. As you can see, I'm uh, using the first two, the, the, uh, the topmost two bytes as the big selector. So when it is zero, it's block zero, and it has all the uh, all the uh, register uh, operations there. So uh, th these uh, here, these things can be uh, very complicated. Uh, the most complicated are the uh, the instruction that uh, needs the most samples are the. Uh, Store HLD and load HLD. So these these two instructions, uh, it basically uh, load or store the HL double register. So you specify in the next two bytes these are the target address. So you have to latch the, these two bytes to form the uh, memory address. And then if you have, and the next cycle, you uh, load or store L uh, register. And in the next cycle, you load or store H register. So it needs five cycles uh, for 
for, for these two uh, instructions. All the other instructions are made up of three. Okay. And the most, instru most instruction did only one cycle. And in, in, in this case, you only need, uh, you only need uh, one, uh, let me see. Hey. Yes. There's one quite difficult instruction, not the 8080, which is exchange HL at the top of the stack. Oh, yes, yes, that, that's easy. Oh, really? Yeah, it's very easy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because the uh, the stack is on chip, okay, and uh, and HL is readily there, so I just select the uh, multiplexer in front of HL to stack po stack pointer, and select the uh, stack pointer, uh, uh, select HL as the source for the stack pointer latch one cycle. Exchange. Yeah, let me let me search it for search for it. Yes. Uh, focus on wrapping up. With okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then then, then the, the exchange is only one cycle. Okay. All the other exchanges are only one cycle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Let me just uh, scan through this this thing. And uh, okay. And uh, so this is a gigantic case statement. And I just want to uh, finish up this. Uh, OK, here is the uh, state, uh, finite state machine. Uh, I just, uh, when you reset, I just, uh, uh, in the uh, PowerPoint, I just uh, initialize a P. But you, you can uh, uh, initialize all the re other registers if you so desire. And once these registers are signed, uh, then it waits for the clock, okay, and do the latching. Okay. So the finite state uh, machine is nothing but doing the latching with a uh, proper uh, select signal. Okay, now let me show you, the last thing I want to show you is the, okay, the simulator. So the simulator, if I simulate everything and turn it on. Okay, uh, this is a good eye test. <laughs> so, uh, just look at the, uh, the, 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 the address, okay? The address line. And it says zero, that's a reset. And uh, here is the, uh, here is the, the uh, reset signal. And after reset, it first uh, execute the uh, instruction, which is the C3 on the data bus, okay? And once it executes the C3, the address uh, bus goes to one and two. It fetches two bytes of the target address, which is 100, okay? So it's a zero, zero, and one, zero. So you got these two uh, instructions and then I just changed to zero, one, zero, zero. Okay, so it's a jump. Okay, and well, I can show you uh, many more, but uh, the time is up. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Besides putting your uh, stack RAM uh -huh. in your CPU, yes. what kept Intel from doing this in 1974? Yeah. Well, I think uh, that's not 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 even uh, not enough uh, uh, gates. It takes real estate to do all this. Right, 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 right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are closing for lunch. See you in a while. <laughs>